Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. I was just reading all the comments. Everybody's uh, checking in from all over the world. Thank you so much. Um, looks like looks like it's kind of a nice day everywhere. So we've got uh, Columbus and Acton, Indiana, Southwest Florida, um, Indiana again, France, Arizona. Uh, I'm reading backwards here. Uh, uh, Norfolk, UK, uh, Oxfordshire, uh, Manchester this week, uh, Ottawa, Maine, Mexico, uh, Selkirk, Manitoba, uh, Kingston, Ontario, and uh, Germany, and uh, yeah, so thank you very much for joining. Today is a very important topic. Uh, I teach a lot, as many of you know, so one of the things that I come across time and time and time again is uh, people are having difficulty uh, learning how to um, determine the right color or determine the right value or the color intensity. And even if they can see it, what do they do about it? How do they, how do they match uh, you know, certain colors that are in their reference picture. So we're going to take a look at that today. And uh, let's get on over to my demo. So uh, a couple of the tools that I'm going to be using. This is my reference picture that I've chosen. I, I, I chose this one. I'll, I'll get into materials in a second. But uh, the reason I chose this particular picture was because it has a uh, a number of different greens and a, and a number of reds like or, orangey kind of colors in here but you'll notice that they're not all the same there's actually a ton of different greens in here so how do you determine what sort of green uh, and how do you get this color here where it, it's kind of a I don't know kind of a brown now you you all know that if you mix uh, red and green it turns into mud right so we got to figure out how to make this color as well. So I'm going to get into that. But just to let you know, I'm going to be working on Arches 140 pound cold press paper. I'm going to be using artist quality paints by Da Vinci. And there's a couple of physical tools that I want to use. So first of all, in order to help this process, one of the easiest things, you don't even have to go out and buy it, is a couple of little squares with a hole in it. Now, some of you have seen me use this before. I know you've seen it before and you think, oh, well, same old, same old. But uh, we're going to we're gonna talk about this a little bit uh, more extensively today. So a couple of squares. These are just two inch pieces of uh, recycled uh, cardboard or Bristol board um, cardstock. Uh, whatever you whatever you have, even even scraps of your watercolor paper will do. So we need this, and we also need some scraps of your watercolor paper. These are very important. Uh, very often I see people that will put down a color and go, oh that's not right, I'll have to fix that. Well, wouldn't it be nice if you could just get the right color in the first place? <laughs> then you wouldn't have muddy colors, right? So in a perfect world, that's what would happen. Now, if you don't like the way that I made these little squares, just trying to find the chat here because it kind of stopped here. Um, the way that uh, the way that I made these little squares was I, I just took the the little square and I simply used a hole punch and I punched a hole. Oh, this is the broken one. I have two of them and one's, one doesn't work. <laughs> this is the one that doesn't work. There we go. So I punched a hole in the middle of it. But you might ha might not have one of these. No problem. Just take a, a little cutting board and your little squares. I'm going to take two at a time here. Here, we'll take two at a time. And I'll just, I'll just line them up. And I'll take a knife and I'll just cut a little square in the middle. You know, don't have to measure it or anything like that. And it doesn't have to be a perfect square. It could be a weird shape. It doesn't matter. The idea behind this is that you are creating a little space 
that shows the color through and doesn't and blocks out everything else around it. Let's see, I didn't cut right through this one, so I'll just cut that a little bit more. There we go. All right, so I've got two squares with little windows in the middle. Same idea. And this will work just as well as the hole punch, of course. All right, so here's where it gets interesting. So I'm going to take the, the little squares that I made here, and I'm going to start comparing things. So before I even go over to my palette and start mixing, it, mixing up any colors, um, especially uh, if I'm, you know, I have a couple of greens on my palette. You've noticed that. I almost never use them. I put them in there to fill up the palette. <laughs> That's basically it. I put them in there to fill up the palette, but I almost always mix my greens. So when I'm looking at my greens, I need to look at this green versus that green. It would be very easy to just get a tube and put some green out and then, you know, adjust the green and so on. But your green probably has a couple of pigments and then, um, the color you're adding to it might have a couple of pigments and before you know it you've got so many pigments in there it really starts getting muddy so I'm gonna look at this green and I'm gonna compare it to say this green so you can see that this green looks almost blue compared to this one which looks kind of like a yellowy leafy kind of green no pun intended but um, this this lighter green has definitely got more yellow, and this one's got more blue. Then uh, go over to here, for example, and this these two are different. This one's duller than this one. And start looking at those types of things, because those are the things that are going to transform your painting. And I know that seeing these things sort of intuitively <laughs> or isn't as intuitive as it might seem at, at the beginning, especially when you're trying to take what you see and translate it into paint. So how do you how do you do this? So that's when this little piece comes in handy. Now I've shown this before, but we want to mix something that is going to match this little space here. I think I shifted it. There we go. That little space there. So if I take a a yellow. Now, choosing which yellow, I would say just choose the one that looks closer to what you see here. Now, I don't think it's this school bus yellow. I don't think it looks like that. It looks a little, well, it obviously looks more greenish. So I'm going to pick this one, that yellow. Okay, so what blue am I going to add to this? I'm going to go right sort of middle of the road here and pick my cobalt blue. Right, and I'll put them side by side on my palette, and I'm going to slowly mix them. And I've only I'm only doing a little puddle here. All right, so I'm going to sort of eyeball it and try to guess approximately the right value. So when I when I go to test it on here, here's what I'm going to do. If I do this, that's hard to really match it, but I can, if I put it right at the edge, look at right at the edge of my paper, I can set it right down beside it and see whether it's the right value or the right color. And I can see that it's, I'm close, I'm very close, but the, it needs to be a little darker, okay, and I darkened it. Uh, it just has a little something else in it, and I can't, it, it doesn't really look like it is um, uh, dull enough, to be honest. So if I take those two colors, two primary colors, and I need to dull it, the obvious um, go-to would be to go across the color wheel. So this palette is very handy for this because um, it, it is arranged like a color wheel, right? So we have our blue, we have our yellow, we have our red. So if I go across the color wheel here, 
and I take a little red and mix a little red into that, that's going to dull this. So I'm going to take another little swatch and see if that's closer. Oh, I think I could go a little back to a little bit more green. Okay, so I think I've got that pretty close now. That looks like it's quite accurate. And if you squint your eyes, you should almost, like you shouldn't really be able to tell the difference between what's in the square and what's on the, on the scrap. <clears throat> so this, this is one of the ways that I use to uh, accurately portray the color. So that's getting the color right. But what if I added too much water to this, right? Because this happens quite often, right? You, you kind of, you're in the right family, but it's too light. And you think, uh-oh, I don't have the right color. I'm going to have to mix something else into it. But really the problem isn't the right color. The problem is it is too watered down. And the same can be true for having things too, um, too dark as well. Let me zoom in on this so that you can really see this um, sort of up close and personal. All right, so there we go. All right, so this was this was my first mix right here. And you can see it looks, it's very, very close. I think value-wise it's very close, but it was too, uh, too pure green. It needed a little bit of dulling down. So I took a little bit of red, the complement, and I added that, and I got something even closer. Probably could go a little bit darker on that, but I think that color is pretty close. Now I took the color, that this color, the one that was pretty accurate, and I watered it down. And you can see that this doesn't look anything like that. So that brings me to the next issue, and that is that when you are mixing your colors, if you're not also considering how uh, light or dark it is, you could go very wrong on your painting. So if you want to get the right value and the right color right off the bat, instead of putting it directly onto your painting, here's what I suggest. Uh, try to match the value here. When you mix it on your palette, it's really hard to estimate the right value. The other consideration is Am I going to be putting this on a wet surface? Because watch what happens. Let me mix a little more color because I, I didn't do very much here. But I'm going to mix that color again. A little bit of red. I always put my color that I'm adding off to the side and slowly add it in to, to get the right value. Let's see if I'm close again. It's still a little too green. I'll add a little more red. <clears throat> All right. So pretty close. I think I could use a little more blue. So this will not only save your um, your time but it's going to say probably save you a bunch of paint, right? So learning how to mix your colors is very important. So if I'm matching this little spot here, um, and, and I make this too dark, let's, so let's get my paint a little thicker here. Kind of the right color, but If I don't put a lot of water in it, and I do um, kind of the, the opposite of what I did here. I think I just colored my card. You can see that it also looks wrong. So while you're mixing your color, you also have to be paying close attention to how light or dark your color is. Like how much water are you adding to that color mix? Because very often, like you, th you th you might have the color just right, but it's too much water or too little water. So as you're mixing your color, here's what I, I might suggest, and that is to take your dark color, put it down, and then start thinning it out. 
to see if it's correct. All right, so there we go. So somewhere in the middle there, I'm, I'm close to that color swatch. Now we can do that for each of these colors. If I were to take just those three colors, the so three primary colors, and do the same thing up here. Now I want to mix this, and you can see this is entirely a different green. You know, night and day different greens. <laughs> can I do this with a photo in iPad? Um, don't have a printer. Uh, you probably can. Just keep one thing in mind when you're looking at a screen that um, the, the, what you're looking at on the screen is, is illuminated from behind. So the problem is, is that when you hold your, your little card, whoops, your little card up to the screen, what happens is you block the light. So unless you actually have a lot of light shining on the card itself, you may not be getting an accurate um, uh, read on that. So if you have an iPad, put it down flat on the table, make sure that there's, there's good um, sort of light all around, you know, shining, shining down on, on the card itself, because you don't want all your light source coming from the, from the iPad or whatever. Uh, but make sure that the card itself has good light as well, because uh, it, that does make a difference when it's illuminated from behind. You know, it's like the difference between a stained glass window and a piece of construction paper, <laughs> because the construction paper doesn't allow the light through, and neither will your, your little card. Um, all right, so if I were to use the same coloring, let's, let's try and use those same colors. So I'll mix over here this time. So since it looks more blue, I'm going to start with my blue. I'll, I'll put a little yellow to the side and mix that in just a little bit. It is, I think it looks mostly blue. Now we'll see how, how close I am. That's not too bad. It's, it's surprising. I mean, our head tells us that this is blue. Or that, it's, pardon me, it tells us that it's green. But what my eyes are seeing is blue. Um, should you take in consideration the color will lighten when it dries? Absolutely, Susan. Um, yeah, Sus that was Susan's comment. And uh, yeah, you do have to consider that it will dry lighter as well. That, that's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so this is wet, so if I make it slightly darker, by the time it dries, it will probably be the correct value. Um, should your paint have a deeper value because it dries lighter? Yes, that, that's basically the same thing, right? So, um, <laughs> yeah, the two Susans do think alike. Um, correct. J. Alvis says uh, watercolor typically dries somewhere between 20 to 30 percent lighter, and that is true. I mentioned earlier that what if you are painting on a wet surface? All right, so you're trying to estimate how something's going to look when you paint on a wet surface. So if I wet this, this is watercolor paper, by the way, the same watercolor paper that I'm using for my painting, right? So if I wet this area first, and I put that same mixture in there. Look how much lighter it is. Uh, I might be close, but by the time that dries, it's going to be extremely light. So I have to go darker with this. You do have to always compensate. It gets, it gets lighter with, uh, as it dries, but, oops, I got a little red in there somehow. Let's start over. <laughs> but as it dries, it uh, will dry lighter, but even almost double as uh, twice as light once it uh, is painted on a wet surface. So I'm going to paint into here now. I have to A, remember I'm working on a wet surface, and secondly, I need to uh, keep in mind that um, the paint, the water that's on the paper is diluting the color I'm putting onto it. So look how vastly different 
these two are when they're side by side. Like that's crazy when you see how different those greens are and yet it's the same plant. Let me zoom out again so you can see. But it's the same plant and we have that. All right, so that is um, sort of how I get to, you know, the right coloring for things. You can see side by side, that looks pretty close. And uh, up here, that looks pretty close. So uh, that's how I get those greens. Now, what about these weird colors? What, what happens when that comes into play? That's when I would, when I'm using two complements and I don't want to turn it into mud. If I were to take my red and, and, and I did that here on my first color, but if I put too much red into it, it really will just kind of dull it down. If I want to make this feel like it's glowing, like, you know, the, the light is passing through this leaf. That's why it looks differently. And, and this is pretty typical of leaves because when you see the light directly on the front of the leaf, it reflects the sky. But when you see it coming through the leaf, you see all the yellows in it. And that, that's pretty common. It's, it's lighter and it is more yellow. Uh, would glazing be good to get the right value? It sure would. Um, in fact, I'm going to do that. So in order to get, uh, let, me, let me go back to this color here first. All right, so that's, that's this color right here. Right, we're matching that one right there. So I'm going to dry it very quickly. Could I have gotten to this stage uh, with different colors? Uh, you bet, I probably could have. So one of the things you might consider as you're mixing your color is, is it an opaque color? Is it, a, is it a granulating color? Is it a staining color? Um, and if it's one of those and it's not desirable in your painting, so let's say, let's say you want to make this a pretty smooth wash, uh, you probably don't want little, little gritty looking um, granules in it, you know, for a, with a, um, a granulating color, right? So, and if you think you might be using a technique where you're sort of lifting out highlights or something like that on these ribs, if you think you might be using that, maybe don't use a staining color. All right, so this is dry. This was this, was this nice bright color. And if I were to take now my red, now this is a permanent rose I'm using. And if I were to glaze that over top, I'm going to end up dulling down. Uh, I think I'm going to put a little bit of blue in it as well. Just hardly any, but a little bit. And it looks brighter right now. It does look brighter. However, I know that it's going to dry darker. And the one thing I know about reds is reds dry duller as well. So let's dry this. I might not have it. I don't think I have it yet. I, I, I will fess up and say I don't think I have this yet, but I'll show you what you can do about it. So in terms of glazing, you can see, see it getting duller as I'm drying this. All right, so you put it on. It's too bright. Uh-oh, it's too bright. I want to dull it even more. So. I think I can take uh, a little bit of my blue. Let's put a little blue into this. And I can get that duller. And I can work out what I need to do on my painting uh, and, and know that and feel confident that if I glaze it or if I mix the color accurately in the first place, I'll be okay. Doing it on your a little scrap of paper. I mean, I can't stress enough um, how helpful 
a scrap of paper can be. I don't throw anything out. These are so useful. It's when it's when students will put on their their color and and then it, and it's on their painting, and they go, oh, uh, it, it's dull. What do I do now? <laughs> well, once it's dull, it's dull. So look what look how close this is now that it's dry. I I think it's a little dark. I think it's a little dark, but I think I'm I'm pretty close to the color. If I thin that down a little bit, there, I can get pretty close to that. So I know what to do when I go to my paint, when I go to my, um, uh, when my actual, I actually go to paint it, right? Uh, how would I decide between something translucent and opaque as a base color? That's a very good question. Uh, if I were to use something like an opaque color, but I'm trying to show the, say, the the um, the luminosity of that leaf, like I want to show that the light is coming through, I actually want to see the white of the paper coming through that color. So I probably would not use a, um, a cadmium color or an opaque color for that. Transparent colors are certainly best for things like glazing. This is glazing, where we took the original color, we put more color on top to shift it, and that needs to be transparent. So it's not going to shift the color underneath if it just simply covers it up. So an opaque color will cover it up. So opaque colors are not ideal for glazing techniques. I'm going to try a little bit of this again. Just going to mix a little bit of green into it too. So that's pretty good. I, I, I think that that's, that's getting me closer. But I do think this, this red that I'm adding in, it's too, it's too bright pink. So if I dull it with a bit of blue, if I dull it just slightly, or if I shift it to maybe another red, Maybe another red would be a better option. So if I went to a lizard and crimson instead of permanent rose, that might give me a closer to what I'm looking for uh, uh, color, right? So I can shift these things and get the colors that I'm looking for. And this is, this is green and I've added red to it. Typically that would make mud. And it with the color underneath and by glazing techniques, it doesn't tend to look as dirty as if I just took all the colors and mixed them together. So if I took my green here and mixed my my green like this and I put more red into it, this can tend this tends to look a little bit more um, I don't know how to describe it. It's just more muddy. It just doesn't look quite as um, lively as putting the color in in glazes. That's why sometimes my realistic work, I have a lot of glazing going on. I have uh, lots of layers because I have to um, build it up to the correct value or to the correct uh, color. <sighs> okay, no problem, True. Um, <clears throat> How would I decide between... Okay, I answered that question. All right, so... Um, yes, uh, all right, so... Yeah, and the importance... You're right, uh, um, JLO says uh, that painting on the same paper that you are using on here is very important because it will uh, greatly affect how differently a color will look. Would underpainting work? Underpainting meaning, well, that's what glazing is. Basically, I've underpainted with the green and then I glazed on it with uh, more of a red color. And that is giving me this 
this kind of color. So now I, I know what to do with these leaves now. I want to I want you to consider one more thing because the thing I find um, really really common in in classes is that students don't always notice uh, things like how light this is. That to me that is like white of the paper kind of white. That's how bright that highlight is. So what happens is you look at something like this and you put down the green and you go but it's not very light because you filled it in you didn't notice that it was almost white of the paper so instead of looking at this and thinking i want to make this look like a leaf just say to yourself you've got to change this mindset you have to look at it and um, realize that you're looking at a shape how light's the shape how dark's the shape and the color is you know, just what you use to change those values. So you've, you've set out your colors already, and now where to put them and how thin to put them or how thick to put them. Like, look how look how light this is. And this is reflecting this, this color here. Um, we're not seeing any of this color down here in this little part of the leaf that's turned over, and yet this is all part of the same leaf. It's because we're looking at the light hitting the top of the leaf, which probably has a little bit of gloss to it. Uh, the tip of it um, turns down and becomes very, very dark. It's probably a little bit, um, you know, a little bit decayed because it's on the tip. And, uh, and, and also this stem is really dark. How are you going to get this, this brilliant glow beside that, though? Wow, that's that's like... That's amazing glow, right? To have that in your leaf. So let me show you in a practical sense. I'm going to um, just quickly paint on uh, this leaf. I'm not going to worry about getting all of this in at the same time. So I'm going to take a, a large brush. It's a big area to cover, so I'm going to... Um, well, first I'm going to mix my colors, what I'm going to do. So I already know what colors to use. I've got my, um, this is an areolin, which is a hue. And I put those colors side by side so that I don't get it overly, um, <laughs> overly blue. I hate getting my yellow well all messed up so I try to remember to rinse my brush in between all right so I'm getting a nice bright kind of green does the whole leaf have to be the same green this this green let's check this out it's that green as the same color as what's down here no it's got to get a lot darker so I'm going to sort of take that into consideration as I'm working different areas of this not that wet. Um, all right, I'm going to take another brush just to wet this. So I would have to do the turnover on the leaf, this this little triangle shape here. I would have to do that different or separately from the underside of the leaf because it's completely different colors might be close in value in some places you know if you're painting something it might be very similar but if it's a different color or different um, temperature so i haven't really talked too much about temperature yet but uh, temperature plays a big role too um, this this sort of a green is a warm temperature and this is definitely a cool temperature because this one's got a lot more yellow and this one's got a lot more blue so I'm wetting this whole section that I want to paint so that it'll just have the get rid of that white paper If this sounds familiar to any of you, let me know, because um, 
I know that this, you know, I'm trying to cover things that when I'm teaching in person and I see what's going on with the students a little more than I can see what's happening online. But um, when I'm teaching in person and I see students, this is this is really, really common. So if you have a problem with um, getting the values right or getting the colors right and, or not seeing colors or not seeing, you know, where the highlights are and things like that, let me know. I th I think that it's a, uh, you're not alone, that's for sure, I, but I, I'm sure uh, I'd love to see sort of a show of hands or just comment if that is something that you have been working on. Uh, <laughs> Shapeshifter? <laughs> uh, do I write down the recipe of the colors as well? Very good question, Dave. Um, yeah, I, absolutely. And I strongly advise that for um, students because, you know, if you're in a class and you run out of time or the class winds down or something like that and you're not done, you need to remember what that recipe is. So on your little on your little card, you could write it here, but what if you lose this card? Myself, if I'm going to make a note about what my colors are, you know where I write it? I write it on the tape. I write it on the margins here. And uh, and then I'll try and tape the card to the to the painting so that I have that reference. You, you could also just sort of section off a part of your paper just for color testing. But um, but then you end up with a different size of painting. All right. So even though I know that this, even though I know this is going to be that brownish color, I know how to go about it. But first I want to get rid of the white of the paper and put this color in. So that's what I'm doing. I've got a little piece of lint here. And so I'm covering everything with this bright green. And it's much brighter than, than the finished result. And this is, I think, what throws so many people off. They look at this and they go, that's not the right color. That's way too light. And I used to be the same way. So if you start with the, like the shadowy colors or the deep, darker colors in here, if you start with that, you lose this. So I, I always start with whatever the highlight is first. That's a big... That's something to remember. Oh, start with your highlight color first. That's the highlight color. It's the brightest thing in the picture. Or in that leaf, at least. Now I can come into this little bit more of a bluish color. Well, it's very shiny right now. Look at this. It's like super shiny. That's too wet. Look at the paint's even running. So that's too wet for me to um, really go into this and, and shift any of this color yet. Because if I did it right now, uh, that little glow on either side of the stem is going to fill in, right? And I know that if, if I work really wet, the color will rush and just spread. So I have to wait a little bit. And um, just wait for that shine to die about down a bit. And then my, if, the, if the paper starts drying a bit, guess what has to happen? My brush has to get drier as well. And so if, you, if you're constantly ending up with brush marks in your washes or um, blossoms or things like that, that is definitely a consideration. Uh, I'm looking at the screen right now and it sees all this white paper and then it sees this yellow. So the camera does something funny and it's going to shift that color. Like if I put my hand in, look at the color the yellow sh changes and it changes back. And the, that's the camera that's doing that. That's the way that cameras are designed. They're designed to adjust to things. So as, as nice as YouTube is and everything, just keep in mind that we are limited by a camera and in its ability to read color. 
which makes it a little bit tricky to to teach online when it's doing all this shifting on us but um, I'm just tipping this so because I see that some of this is still running running very freely on my paper and so I'm going to take my paper towel and blot it. You can see I've got more of this, this blue mixture here. I'm just blotting it, the belly part here. And let's give it a test. Not too bad. It's not going to spread too far. So I'm going to leave a larger gap there than what I actually see because I know it's going to spread. Alright, so I'm going to come in and put a little bit of that in there. Just I'm just shifting it a little bit. I'm not trying to do the finished thing, the finished uh, color. but I want it soft. So I'm making sure that I'm working this in while it's wet. And so why am I doing this? I'm doing this mainly to create some form in this leaf. It, it's otherwise going to be just flat. Did I add any red to the base color? Yes, there was a little bit of red in there. And just going to come in just a little bit darker. I'm working on wet, so what do I have to remember? Gosh, I feel like I need a prize for the person who gets the right answer. What do I have to remember if I'm working on wet? Uh, sorry, I'm not jumping in on it yet because I haven't got... Um, there's a, like a little delay. So I don't see it. I don't see your answers instantly. <laughs> it takes a second, but um, just want to see if you remember. Anybody? Whoops! I click something I shouldn't have there. Brush must be drier. Yes. Brush must be drier. But there's one more thing to remember. It dilutes the shade and will dry lighter, correct. So I have to compensate for the fact that it will dry extra, extra light. Extra light. Because I'm working on wet paper. You know, that was, I gotta confess, this was one of the things that really um, I struggle with a lot because uh, I'm always putting something down on a wet wash and I'm too timid about the color and it dries and I go, darn it, I have to go again. It's, it's too, it's dried too light. And this one I'm sure will too, <laughs> but you know, I've never quite conquered it, but you know, you're probably a braver soul than I am, but um, I'm just indicating some of those little ribs here. Just I'm always brushing in the right direction for the for the plant. I'm not worrying about any of the water drops on this picture right now, by the way. But but you see what I'm trying to maintain. You can see the lines for the center stem. I'm trying to maintain that really bright area on either side. Okay, so I'm going to dry this. And uh, admittedly, I'm probably too light. <laughs> but you know, sometimes you just have to do it twice. But if I if I needed to do it twice, or if you're working if you're working on this, and all of a sudden you're starting to see brush marks, don't keep going. Uh, just I know it's hard to stop in the middle of something when you know before it's done. But stop 
dry it, re-wet it, and then keep going. It's the only way to keep it fresh looking. All right, so you can see it dulling down as it as it dries. This really does look quite a different color on the screen than it does in person. Let me see if I, zooming out will help. Sometimes zooming out and, and incorporating something else gives you a better color. It's still too yellow on the screen. It, it's tricky when you're trying to juggle the the uh, limitations of the limitations of the um, camera with the uh, with the other and and this picture looks okay because that's sort of layered on top but it's the camera reading what I'm painting that's uh, that needs a little adjustment so let me see if I can get this um, looking more correct just give me a second okay whoop not that way That's probably getting closer to what I've actually put down. Um, let's uh, let's go with that. Okay, so that's a little closer to what I've actually put down. Uh, I know the camera was reading it kind of weird. And uh, so I want to put in some cool colors. All right, these are considered cool colors because they're more blue. They're darker, but they're more blue. And we also have to think about these uh, warmer colors that are going to go on top as well. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of things that will um, affect the the lens. Uh, in Yeah, the, and the document camera, uh, it's a document camera, <laughs> so, you know, it's, read, it's meant for documents and stuff. It's it's great because it has the remote, which means that when it's mounted to the ceiling, I can I can adjust it and everything. But uh, but yeah, cameras will compensate. If they see too much warm, it will cool it. If it sees too much cool, it will warm it. If it sees it too light, it'll darken and so on. It's it's you know the automatic settings on a camera will do that. So um, I can also let me see here if I can switch up my temperature on my light here as well. Um, I've got a light beside me here which has different settings too. So anyway, that's that's where I'm starting with this. This is my first layer. This is the getting getting rid of the first, um, or getting rid of that white paper to begin with. <laughs> yes. Um, well, we're not using Zoom right now. We are, we're on YouTube, but um, but yeah, it will um, condense the color. You, basically, when you're seeing it on a screen, it's 72 dpi, and uh, because that's the best quality your screen can produce, but um, it will um, alter things slightly. So keep, keep that in mind whenever you're watching something online. It's really important to have uh, to have um, you know quality lighting when you are. Um, uh, doing a, a demonstration. Let me let me see if I can adjust my other light here. Uh, now it's really looking kind of strange, but um, but probably closer to what I'm working on. All right, so I'm going to take and and this is this is dry enough, not perfectly dry, but it's it's it doesn't it's not going to move anywhere. So I'm going to wet it again. I always find that I have to do some sort of camera adjustment when I start a painting versus when I've got more of the painting done. As soon as I put in some of the contrast and less of the white paper is showing, everything starts adjusting uh, automatically on the camera. So I usually have to make adjustments part way through my paintings as I'm, as I'm working. And I'm probably not going to get all of this um, leaf study done today. 
Uh, I might continue this one next week. We'll see. But um, I'm not going to rush this one because I want you to understand the process of glazing and layering um, and, and getting the colors and, and the values more correct in the, in the beginning. Do I only paint in daylight? Oh, I wish I had the luxury of that. No, I actually paint um, paint a lot at night because I don't um, I don't have that much disposable time in the day. I'm teaching most days, so uh, <clears throat> I don't have that much uh, time for my own painting. I, I do paint. Uh, I, I paint all day, you know, I'm pretty much painting all day as I'm teaching, but I will also um, paint myself at night. I'm painting day and night. <laughs> That's dedication, right? Um, but anyway, I'm mixing up my my bluer color now. This is my cobalt blue, my areolin hue. You can, you probably can't read that, it's too small, but uh, this is my areolin hue. I'm making it darker because, first of all, it is darker. And secondly, it's quite blue. These these lines that come down here, these ribs on the, uh, on the leaf. Note, I want to keep that light. Uh, always think about what you, what you need to um, preserve. Uh, I need to preserve that light area there. Yes, I am using artificial light. Um, I have uh, I have daylight bulbs and like I have warm and cool bulbs in my uh, fluorescent fixture here. I also have a light to my right, a light to my left, which has uh, various settings. I can I can actually show you on the camera. Um, so I have a setting right now that is a warm light. That is a cool light. see so that's the standard cool light different you know settings um, come on now if I hold it see did you see the light change um, so I, I will use different light settings uh, so it will affect uh, what it looks like if I'm especially if I'm recording something so I'm trying to consider all of these things, the camera and the lighting and all of these things. So it's kind of a little bit of a juggling act. All right, so that gave this enough time to soak in a little bit, some of that moisture. I'm gonna blot my brush because my brush needs to be drier. Okay, that's not too bad. I'm gonna blot it a little bit more. I'm going to get a nice um, rib effect here. Blotting my brush. I won't be able to have any control unless I blot my brush. Trying to start each of these in the same, approximately the same spot. Actually, they they kind of dip down a little bit, so we'll do that. There's like a little arch there, and then it sweeps up. Blot my brush. Hmm, can't really get two ribs out of that. I have to blot. I have to fill up my brush each time, but blot after each fill, so that it's not too wet. So as I'm doing this. I gotta, I gotta remember. Okay, it's, I don't just go to the top using this technique. I'm also looking at. Are these straightening out? 
I think they are. They kind of curve and then they sort of straighten out a little bit and then they definitely curve up here with the with this rusty color. So I'm going to do a few that are a little bit straighter. They also don't look like they go right over to the side. So I'm, I'm telling you what I'm thinking out loud because if you know my like the thoughts that are going through my head as I'm painting then you'll understand you know why I'm doing what I'm doing and maybe those are considerations that you'll um, think about when you're working on your painting. And I think that's about as far as that goes. There's a little hint of some of this blue color down here so I'll just hint at a little bit of that here. They're not as strong. Oops, I didn't go very straight there. Okay, just hinting at some of that. I guess I should really start at the bottom here. There we go. All right, so we're getting some of the, and look at that bright, like that color was so crazy bright when we started. And look what's happening to it now. As we glaze on top, as we start to build up colors, that's losing its impact. That's why I'm telling you to go with the lightest and brightest colors first. Um, I'm just reading some of the comments here. Uh, I got I got two circle lights that have adjustable brightness and color temperature. I had them set too bright at first and my paintings turned out too dark. <laughs> yeah, it takes some adjusting. Um, yeah, the same thing happens in the sun. You're right. If you're paint, painting plein air and you're in the sun, yeah, you're going to overcompensate for the brightness. I mean, your eyes will do kind of the same thing your camera does. That's why they dilate, dilate and... Um, and so on. Um, yeah, like I mean, in the winter months, for in particular, you've got um, you've certainly got the uh, uh, you know the less daylight hours kind of to consider. So I'm mixing up that rusty color now. That red, I'm going to put red, some of the blue, just a little bit of blue. I'm going to mix that with some of my green here. And this is what I'm going to glaze over top. Remember I wanted to get, I've already determined that I can get this um, this rusty color. This was the one that I mixed pre, like previous, like just mixed all the colors together. And look how flat looking it is. It's so much more interesting when you glaze it over top. Um, there's something more glowing about that. But I need to I get, need to get a move on here because I know that my paper's um, going to start drying on me. So I'm going to start. Let's see. I think I'll need a little bit more green in here. Just a little bit more. But there we go. My brush has to be more blotted because it's really going to um, it, it's really going to uh, be affected by how dry how the paper is drying. Putting this over top of some of the previous. Uh, blues that I put down, or greens I should say, and there's kind of a notch there. And you can mark all these things on your drawing and, and things like that, but you have to be really careful with something like this. Um, this, is, this is another consideration. If you are um, painting something like this where all the changes are kind of subtle, you got to watch your pencil lines. Your pencil lines can really kind of ruin the effect if they are are showing through all of these transparent colors. I 
I think a little tiny bit more blue. Just to help get that a little bit darker. All right. So I'm looking for that that line, this line. Do you see that line, light line that goes up there? I'm putting that in. This really starts curving. I guess I got to get that into into the stroke as well. Okay, so then I'm going the other way. That edge is going to end up being pretty dark too. And now I'll probably glaze some more on top of this. Uh, glazing maybe with uh, like dry brush. I might use a dry brush effect because some of this is quite sort of broken up. Uh, it's it's not very uh, smooth, right? This this has a real tendency to uh, break up and look speckled like freckles so if I want to get that effect I can use a bit of dry brush on that I didn't want to pencil all of this in because I knew that if I if I were to do that really the pencil lines would kind of spoil the effect I don't mind pencil line pencil in my painting uh, but I try not to uh, deliberately make it show. All right, I'm going to pick up a little more color in some of these places. So, like along this edge here, it's like quite it starts getting quite dark here. I'm just sort of flicking in, and it, I can feel the paper really getting dry now which is actually good where I'm working because where I'm working at the moment, I actually do want it to be a little bit darker, a little bit more sort of defined. Brush has to be drier than the paper though. It's the only way to avoid those unwanted blossoms. Now, is this done? No, it's not done, but it's getting there. Like I would, I would probably put some more on here, but I'm kind of feeling the that that patterning on that leaf now, though. No, oh, it's getting too dry, so time to time to abort. <laughs> I I'm, I can feel it sort of snatching that that color. It is not staying wet enough for me. I'm going to, but what I can do is I can dry this and I want to get that stem in the middle because I think if I get that stem in the center, uh, what printer do I use? Sorry, I didn't finish my sentence. If I put the stem in the center, I have a dark with which I can compare my values. So I haven't talked too much about values. I mean, I, we did. We talked about thinning the color or, or putting less water in. But um, I want to put the darkest dark into my painting here. And if I do that, then I have the full value range. Like I have the lightest light and the darkest dark. And then I can um, start to determine where the, all the, like how far I need to take this. Like this, I know, is too light right now, that little section there. Ooh, that's not dry enough. I just felt that with my hand. It's not dry enough. I started off kind of slow on this project today just because I really wanted to bring you into the 
the real thought process behind all of this and, and the steps that I take and why my paintings take as long as they do. And when I teach something, I can't slow it down to the degree that I might want to, just because, you know, we have, we have an hour to show it or we have three hours to do the workshop or whatever the case may be. So I have to, I have to sort of fast track it that doesn't mean that I'm working it a lot. It just means that I'm building slow. Uh, and, and there's there's certainly a difference there. I'm just going to let that cool down a little bit. Um, yeah, water-soluble graphite to avoid craft, uh, pencil lines is good. Um, it, it does, you're right, it does add a gray tone. Um, but you can also use uh, watercolor pencils. So if I were drawing this this leaf, for example, and you wanted to indicate where, you know, th these lines, you know, maybe you're not very good at doing those curves or whatever, uh, you could you could first do them with watercolor pencil and then you have an idea. So this is cooling down now. I'm going to go back into that color that I mixed up, some of that green and red, mostly red. and not very much water because I know that this has to be quite dark and I'm working on dry because it has a hard edge. So there's an indicator indicator right there. If it has a hard edge, you want to work on dry. Now there's a hard edge out here, but I didn't wet past that spot so the paint stopped. But in the, you know, if you're trying to do a detail here, you don't wet the paper first. Now I think this is going to have to get a little darker, probably a little redder too. But I've got something in there. Now let's get a little bit more red, maybe even a touch of blue, and see if I can get this as dark as it needs to be. Now as I'm painting this, I can do this very same thing that I started off doing with um, Oh, I made the edge ugly there. Um, I can do the very same thing that I started off with my little color swatches. I can take my little squares and compare. Is it light enough or dark enough? Or does it need to be shifted in any way? Like, is it too green or is it too red? All right, so I'm getting something. That's That's the value that I was looking for there. So... Now it's still wet, so it may it may dry a little bit lighter, and so I need to remember that. <clears throat> but I've maintained that glow around the side, that that glow on each side of that. I needed to keep that, so putting that down first, putting this this being darker, I, it was easy to cover that up. I didn't have to paint around that. So, um, you know, if you can paint under something, uh, do it. <laughs> if you, you know, if there's a darker color going on top, uh, then you don't have to worry about it. Just put the darker color on top. The only, the only thing would be is if, you know, it were a, uh, like a, a real strong compliment. Like this, this is a compliment. Like you've got a red on top of a green but the red is real dark and the green is real light. But if you had a darker green and you were trying to put a red on top, uh, that would definitely dull down your red. You would probably have to paint them separate. So think about that as you're painting. Um, I'm just gonna make a note here while, uh, while that's drying. I'm just gonna make a note here on my margins. Um, okay, we'll call this uh, lower leaf, okay, lower leaf. leaf and I'm making a note here and it is Ariolan. Uh, cobalt and permanent rose. All right so you might even decide okay well 
it was only a tiny bit of permanent rose. So you might want to put an asterisk or something. Develop a code for yourself so that you understand uh, what was used. So, right, if you put an asterisk beside something, that means only a tiny bit. And that will help you, you know, when you're remixing. Or, you know, if you write that on here, uh, you know, uh, this is your mixture here, you know, you put a little arrow and you can write what it is and, and make a note on your card. But you can keep track of what you're doing, especially if you are working on a, a multiple of things in a week, like I do, and you're trying to remember, oh gosh, what color did I use? Uh, you know, it's been a week, I don't remember, because you've you've washed off your palette and you've done 10 other things in the meantime. So uh, that's uh, kind of common. So this I'm going to dry. I'm just going to do a little bit more on this leaf. I want to get this little fold over part here. And then, um, and then I think I'll probably continue this. I'm, I'm going to continue this one next week because there's still lots of learning to do in, in the background and in the main leaf and, and all of that sort of thing. So. I definitely think we can continue this one next week. I haven't done too many lately where I've actually sort of completed the project. But let's... Um, I want to talk about this little fold over here. Because this is, as I said, this is one of the areas that often gets neglected. It's leaving that extra... Like it feels like, oh my gosh, that's white paper. It can't be white paper, it's a green leaf. And you, you have this sort of brain battle that goes on. That's like your head says, but no, it can't be white, it's green. But the way that the light hits it makes it appear light. So that's what you have to paint. You have to trust your eyes, not paint what you think it needs to be. You think it needs to be green, of course, but it's it's actually not. Okay, is it cool enough? It's cool enough. All right, so I'm going to take a smaller brush because it's a smaller area. And I'm going to wet in here. Even the highlight, I'm going to wet that too. Because when you have something that curves like hair or an egg or a ball or an apple or anything like that, anything that curves, uh, you probably are not going to have a hard edge. You might if the surface is really shiny, but this isn't like a glossy surface on this leaf. It's, yeah, it's definitely bright. I mean, it's definitely not, um, it's got some shine to it, but it's not like glassy. All right, so I'm dampening this. So you're not going to get those like super crisp edges like you would on like a piece of porcelain or glass or something like that. Um, so I'm going to, if by dampening this, this allows me to um, get a softer edge. All right, now remember the top of this is a completely different green. We've got more, more cobalt and just a little bit of the um, areolin. It's mostly cobalt. I'm working on wet. I'm working on a wet surface, so that means I've got to make my color stronger than what I want to end up with. I have to start off with color stronger. Let's give it a little test here. Not too bad. Okay. Now, I think I'm, I might even be a, a little bit strong. Actually, no, I think I'm actually okay. I was thinking, oh boy, I might be too strong, but I think it's going to be all right. So... I'm putting that on there. It looks completely out of place. But I have to have faith. I know that if 
if I put this on here darker and that when I get more things painted it's going to look okay it's going to look right so I'm just softening this edge a little more right okay there we go so that's nice and soft now maybe a little couple of little it looks too perfect I want to break it up a bit <laughs> right so we don't want it too perfect looking like too smooth and, and you know like ceramic or something like that and um, I'm going to take that that really dark red the one that we used on the stem and in fact it's even darker than that so I'll put a little more blue into it blue will darken it down pretty easily and I'm going to start right here the tip where it's darkest So, oh boy, you know, I wet that and it didn't stay wet very long, did it? So what am I going to do? Oh dear, what am I going to do? Well, I'm just going to not panic. I'm going to make sure this, this edge is wet right here, that edge where I need it soft. I make sure that's wet. And I'm just going to quickly rinse and blot my brush. And from the top, like this way, with the point of my brush into the paint, I'm going to just sort of wiggle and shake my brush, and that's going to soften that edge. Let's blot my brush again. I can go again. And, and when it, anytime I'm trying to soften an edge like that, I need to lay my brush down. I'm not, uh, my brush isn't up straight like this. It's laying down. I'm dampening, what I'm doing is it, by laying my brush down, I'm damping that white area in the middle so that that will just help that color to crawl out a little bit. As long as my brush isn't too wet and the paint's not too wet, it will, um, um, it won't crawl all the way out. All right, so I think there's a little hint of it over here, just a little line basically, and that gives us our little curl over. Now I've made it a little more tidy than what's here. These are water drops on here, so that makes it look a little bit more sort of um, irregular than it even is, but I think it's still a little too red, so I'm going to put a little blue into this, like actual blue. And that's going to darken that even further. Look how, how much darker that got. All right, and as we build this up, like if I start coming back in here and start building up some more in there, you can see that this will develop and that, you know, it'll, it'll start to evolve like a Polaroid picture. And, but I really wanted to show sort of the the early like under what's underneath all of that detail when you see my finished paintings they look um you know they look like they were just done in one step maybe but in truth they were probably done in multiple layers that's how i got all these variations in the colors here and i'll have to come in now and build that up and and start to make it darker um but as i as I mentioned, I'm going to take this and sh compare with my reference. Let's use the square one since I'm using the square. And um, I think this red's too bright. What do you think? To me, it looks like it's um, just a little bit too uh, brilliant red. So let, let's talk for one second about um, color intensity. Okay, so the color's too intense. It's, it's like almost like a burgundy right out of the tube kind of thing. It needs to be dulled down a little bit to look natural. So if I were to do that, if I were to dull this down, 
I've got kind of a, a rusty red and if I wanted to dull it down I could put in the opposite if it's a red I want to put in a green so I I have my mix here but I probably need a little more green to dull it a bit so um, how do I get such smooth lines and curves? Is there a trick to it? Yeah, smooth lines, lines and curves, um, actually straight lines too, are are done more easily when when the brush handle is going in the direction. Okay, so as I'm doing the curve, the brush handle's changing, right? If I if I want to do that, unless it's a wide, like, I'm trying to get a wide stroke, then I'll sort of lay the brush down and use the side of the brush. But in any case, I'm, I'm moving my whole arm. I'm not using my wrist. Like that would be using my wrist, right? To make the curve like that. And it's hard to make a, a good curve that way. And, and these ones would be even more awkward because, you know, I'd have to sort of move my arm around in an uncomfortable position. It might be easier for me to work this way. There's a natural curve to the way your hand works, right? So f use that. And if you've got a fine line like this, like a small line, instead of using the side of the brush, use it like this, right? So you're using a little bit more of the, not necessarily the point of the brush, but you're pulling like the length of the brush, right? So the length of the brush is, is going like this instead of going sideways. Sideways will give you a much broader stroke. So it's like this, that might even give you a broken line versus this, right? I, I've got one that was the same brush, but it's given me two different lines. Uh, but the big thing about keeping it smooth, especially if you have a little bit of a, you know, maybe you have a little bit of a tremor or something like that. Your hands aren't steady. Um, use your, get your arm into it. Use your whole arm. Um, sometimes, Painters will even stand when they're painting just so that their whole arm does get into it. Um, personally, I work more at a table and I like to rest my arm, but this part of my arm is is not laying on the table. Maybe my elbow is and I'll just move the whole arm. Like I'll just, the whole arm is going into this uh, stroke. So I find that very helpful. And, and that applies to like doing straight lines like this one here, right? Uh, you notice I didn't do this one this way. I had I had my brush this way as I did this. You can check that on the replay. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'm brushing in this direction. If if I was trying to clean up an edge, I might get up on the point and and do that type of thing. But generally, it's just pulling down in that direction that really helps. All right, so we're going to. Um, I think we're going to wrap this one up and uh, yeah is it is going to be darker yeah and, and we will build up layers so I'm going to do a little bit more of that uh, sort of next week I, I spent a bit of time talking about the color mixing and and how I determine what colors I'm going to use uh, because that's something often I just sort of hand out right it's like here use this color or this color but you need to know what goes into the the thinking process of choosing the right colors and the best way the easiest way of finding that um, is to paint at the edge of a that's why all my scraps are strips you know if you paint in the middle like if I paint something in the middle here it's very hard to tell I mean I can sort of glance at it and maybe it helps but I really don't know until I paint it right at the edge uh, and let it dry and then I'll know if it's the right color or not so uh, Anyway, that's that's that. I'm going to continue this one next week, and we will um, we'll look at the different things that, that go into creating these leaves as well. Uh, so we'll finish up this one. Uh, we'll finish up this one, and then we'll go on to this one and this one, and we'll we'll put in a, a little bit of a background, but it won't be detailed like this. Uh, sometimes when you're taking the photography, like when you're taking the photo you don't have the option of what's in the background. What's in the background is in the background. So you just have to sometimes take a little bit of um, artistic license and edit the photo for the better of betterment of the painting. All right, so I'm going to, um, I'm going to wrap this one up for today. That's uh, kind of a long one. And uh, 
hope to see you again next week for part two. Stay tuned and uh, we will see you then. Have a great week, everybody. Bye for now.